Order. Um, it's now time for questions to the Minister of Education. We'll start with listed questions. I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Mr. Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. Minister. Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. The Department aims to provide a funded preschool place to every child in their immediate preschool year whose parents want it. In each of the last five years, at least a minimum of 99.8% of children whose parents stayed with the preschool admissions place to the end have received an offer of a funded preschool place. The aim is reflected in the delivery plan for the draft programme for government currently out for consultation, and I intend to ensure that children in their immediate preschool year continue to benefit from access to high quality, universal, early years education uh, provision in the future. I also plan to work with other ministers and key departments uh, in the delivery of actions within the draft programme for government and beyond, aimed at providing well-being and tackling disadvantage through high quality early years education and childcare provision. Uh, the department will be engaging on the delivery plan over the next few weeks to help inform the uh, development of the key interventions contained in the published delivery plan, in, including to extend responsive quality provision in early uh, childhood uh, education and care initiatives for families with children aged three to four of up to 38 weeks uh, per year. I hope to bring forward the full version of the childcare strategy to my uh, executive colleagues in the, in the coming months. Uh, having taken account of the many consultation processes received, the programme for government and the new opportunities that now exist to align early uh, to align childcare and early years initiatives. Uh, I look forward to engaging with executive colleagues in more detail in this matter and in due course. And I would also indicate, I suppose, in terms of the, uh, when we are looking at a expansion of universal provision of early years education, obviously the definition of that in terms of what we're talking about can cover a multitude of subjects. Uh, and I'll be happy if there are more specific areas that the uh, member wants to engage in, in addition to whatever uh, response that I'm able to give to a supplementary. I'll be happy to engage with the member if he wants to drill down into some of those, those aspects. Thank you, Mr. New. Supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed for the, the qualification at the end, because it does concern me when I suppose we talk about early years, we immediately look at, at, at um, sort of preschool provision and, and, and childcare. As, as the Minister will know, early years is everything from naught to six, um, which is why it's key that, that, that he works with his. Uh, particularly with his ministerial colleague, the Minister for Health. So to, to, to come to my point, um, obviously Sure Start is, is a provision we have in a target uh, situation in, in Northern Ireland. Is there, is there any proposals to expand that and even look at it as a universal service or something of its, its some similar? Minister. In terms of the investment in Sure Start at, uh, at present, uh, the department is, um, I suppose, uh, providing already £25 million. That relates, I think, to support around 40,000 children under the age of four and their families. Now, obviously, the priority is, is ensuring that all children reach their full potential. It is a targeted, at uh, the moment, sure start, and there has been some expansions of that, a targeted um, service, which is distinct geographical remit, defined by ward boundaries. And I know that that can be, therefore, a slightly sort of blunt tool. Um, what it does mean that all those within the catchment areas who have children under the age of four uh, can access those services. It was initially uh, on the basis of 20 per cent of, of disadvantaged areas. That has now been extended uh, to 25 per cent of the most disadvantaged areas. Findings from independent review of Sure Start together with existing research provide assurance that targeting is in areas of highest disadvantage is likely, therefore, to have the greatest impact. Now, the member indicates, and I suppose in an ideal world, if there was a sort of a limitless level of, of money. If you're talking about, for example, if you, if you do a rough uh, rule of, of thumb, that if you're, you're talking about a movement from targeting 25% to 100% coverage, for instance, in something like Sure Start, given the current level of funding, that would probably be uh, an increase in terms of cost of maybe somewhere in the region of about 70 to 75 million per year, which I think would be, uh, you know, would be very difficult, I think, in many ways to achieve in that regard. I suppose part of the, the reason as well for the support for Sure Start, and I think he does make a valid point in terms of cooperation with health, because I think particularly in terms of Sure Start, there's a, a large health component uh, to this. I suppose part of this is to try to give some degree of a better start to those who are coming from disadvantaged areas, to try and close that, that level of gap. I suppose at one level, while it may well be advantageous to every people in Northern Ireland, 
if we were to move to a situation in which uh, that was completely universal, it wouldn't have a particular impact, therefore, on, on closing any gaps uh, on that basis, albeit, I think, objectively, would be regarded as something of good point. Thank you. I call Barry McElduff. Uh, further to Mr Agnew's question, um, I want to point out that I think it was your predecessor, Minister O'Dowd, who was able to increase from 20% to 25% most socially depraved areas, but could I ask the Minister, is there any scope for looking at pockets of deprivation within what might be regarded as otherwise affluent wards? You know, of course we want universal provision, but in some other ways regarded as affluent wards, there are big pockets of deprivation. Yeah, I understand the point that's being driven, and I think that particularly um, in terms of the distribution, for instance, of housing within Northern Ireland, I suppose one of the unusual features that we tend to have in terms of our areas, which probably makes us a differentiation from uh, other jurisdictions in that regard, is you quite often have these very small pockets. Uh, I suppose the, the issue to some extent is that you would have to change the basis on which the, the scheme was administered if that, if that was the case. Uh, again, if you were to simply add those to that, that would be an additional uh, cost uh, onto that. If it was, and it, there would be a level of controversy if, if you were using those effectively to replace some of the wards that, that, that were there. I think the other issue in terms of what the provision of Sure Start, again, in terms of the different projects, they have to have a certain level of economies of scale to be able to provide. You know, you can't provide a Sure Start for three children, for instance. Uh, and so, therefore, I think the other issue in terms of ensuring that you have sufficient numbers of under fours from particularly disadvantaged areas, you know, whether you could string together, for instance, some pockets of deprivation, I think that, that again, would create a certain level of difficulty. So that I, I understand entirely where the member is coming from um, in relation to that. I suspect that either from a financial point of view or a practical point of view, may create certain hurdles and difficulties which would be very difficult to overcome. Thank you. I call Carla Lockhart. Can I thank the Minister for his answers uh, thus far? Um, and I'm sure he will uh, extend his congratulations to the Sure Start, the extension of it in the Mournview Ward within the Lurgan area. But can I ask the Minister uh, why we should really focus on early years uh, and the importance of it uh, in the overall educational offering within Northern Ireland? Well, uh, first of all, I suppose add my congratulations to the, the Mournview. I mean, I suppose that's showing that all politics is local, even for the under fours. Uh, can I say in terms, of, in terms of that, but I'm sure the member is rightly proud of, of what is happening on that basis in, in Upper Band. In terms of the question on the focus on early years, I think uh, there is a range of research. I think it's, it's research and evidence which is very much pointing in the same direction, which highlights the importance of early years to cognitive, emotional, social and physical growth of, of children. Uh, it's vitally important that children, as both starting school, uh, have been and continue to be prepared, supported and encouraged to, to learn. Now, one of the, I think, um, consistent messages of the times I will get from schools, particularly primary schools, uh, is, and to some extent, therefore, some of the other arguments that, that are happening at later stages in life are maybe slightly skewed by this, uh, which is that, the, particularly primary schools are telling me that at times, some children are coming in the door of a primary school that they are already well behind on a range of both sort of cognitive issues and social skills where even sort of sometimes using a, a knife and fork is, is, is something which they, they don't um, uh, appreciate. So that intervention which is happening not simply within schools but even before they, children come through the, the school gates I think is vitally important. I think from the point of view therefore it's, it's right therefore that the executive's draft programme for government acknowledges early intervention in the early years, provides that opportunity and that's very much in line with the um, outcome 14 of the draft programme for government, which indicates that one of our aims is to give our children and young people the best start in life. Similarly, I think the delivery plan for indicator 15 of the draft programme for government acknowledges the central role and broad range of agencies and services in taking these interventions forward. Uh, and again, this comes down, I think, to a point that Mr Agnew uh, made in his question earlier on, which is the need to try to ensure that we have joined up services. Um, because particularly if you're dealing with the very young, you're specifically looking at not simply education, Remind the Minister but also the role of, of health. So, yes, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, is a thank you is a reply. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, opportunities for training, continual 
professional development and sharing of best practice are underdeveloped in the early years a sector what plans does the minister have to include these opportunities and then i mean clearly we've got to look and see uh, and in terms of child care strategy, in terms of the children and young people strategy, there is an element of things which we will need to look at where we can provide that training and professional development. I think she also makes a very valid point, uh, and it goes beyond simply early years, but also permeates other areas of, of education. There are a lot of good things that are actually happening out there on the ground. And at times, uh, both in terms of the best possible delivery, it is a question of, uh, for example, trying to look and see uh, how we can actually best explain and indeed uh, promulgate that, that best practice. Uh, I know that's happened in a number of initiatives that, is, that are there. Um, recently, I know that, uh, and some of that I think can be disseminated by getting stakeholders together. And so, for example, I've recently received an invitation which I've accepted from a group that's been working on the issue of underachievement within the North Down context. They're hosting a conference in February. Um, Again, the focus a lot of that will be on best practice. I think everybody realizes as well that there are tough financial circumstances, so part of it is actually disseminating that, that best practice. I've certainly accepted an invitation to go along to that, speak at that, but also have my officials there. And I think that there can be that, that driver, because even, I suppose, if you take it at a different level, if we were in a situation that financially there was no problems whatsoever and there was uh, a, an abundance of money, Still, the driver of best practice should actually be a key driver, no matter what financial position we're in, because we should always be ambitious and agree with the member to try to ensure that we get the best for uh, all our children. Thank you. We move on. I call Mr Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Uh, again, I thank the member for his question. The entitlement framework is and will remain a key component of the statutory curriculum, ensuring all pupils have a, access to a broad, balanced and economically relevant range of courses. However, I think as I've said previously, I do appreciate that there are some significant challenges that are there for schools in trying to meet the entitlement requirements in full. They are, in terms of numbers, quite ambitious on that basis. So in light of that, I'm considering the way forward for the entitlement framework policy, including the statutory uh, requirements. However, in doing so, obviously, I want to make sure that uh, we retain the benefits that have been accrued to date and try and build on them. And I'll be meeting soon with officials on that. I think, again, there's probably a two-stage aspect to this. If there's action that needs to be taken in the short term, that will be looked at. There is, a, as I've indicated, it will be opportune within this assembly term to take a wider look at how we're delivering the curriculum. And I think that you can't simply do that with taking um, entitlement framework out in a limb and setting that to a side. So it's about trying to get the right balance so that we get the retention of the best that is there from the entitlement framework without placing an undue burden sometimes on, on school. Mr Lyon, supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer uh, so far and for his willingness to review it. Uh, he's absolutely right that we want to, to get the right balance, but would he agree with me um, that the entitlement framework is um, putting an extra um, burden on um, already uh, tight uh, school budgets uh, and that um, even just a little bit of reform in that area could make things an awful lot easier for schools while at the same time delivering a quality education for all our young people? Well, I think as well, yes, I, I agree with the, the member. I think I suppose to give the specifics of this, that schools are funded, I suppose, through their core delegated budget to deliver the statutory obligations, including the wider curriculum. And of course, the entitlement framework is obviously a major part of that. It obviously is very specifically kicks in at key stage four and the post-16 situation. Um, and I think from that point of view, EF funding has been provided over the last few years, but I think we need to ensure that, uh, that a, a separate stream is not simply a sort of a permanent stream, that we, we sort of as much as possible mainstream what is there? Uh, that funding, I think, to date has provided a contri uh, contribution to costs uh, in terms of the expanded curriculum. I think also it's, it's important, and I think a number of schools are embracing this, that the key issue is actually what is able to be delivered to the students themselves. And so I'll also be looking in terms of uh, the regulations. There are a number of schools, and I think we need to ensure there's credit given to them. There are a number of schools that are operating now in greater levels of partnership, in greater levels of sharing. And particularly when we're talking about, in terms of the entitlement framework, for what might be described as minority subjects where there is a, uh, less of a direct demand. It may be less cost effective for a school to provide that within their individual environment. I think where possible, and I know, for instance, within uh, my own constituency, there's very good work going on, for instance, between Bangor Grammar, Bangor Academy, and St. Colin Banis on providing a, a shared solution in terms of 
um, some of the particularly A-level courses as part of, part of uh, uh, shared sort of education on that basis. And I think that that, in terms of area learning communities, will be something I think that is quite vital as well. We need to explore, in terms of being able to deliver and strike that right balance, that we ensure that, that we get the best possible delivery for all our pupils. And I think using more imaginative solutions can be helpful to that as well. Thank you. I call uh, Patrick McLone. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Um, uh, given that many of the schools are indeed struggling to meet those EF requirements, um, Mr. Lyons, in fact, referred to some of the pressures that's on them. Um, can the Minister advise uh, if there are any particular uh, resources or support available to those schools to help them in that capacity? There has been some additional funding has come through EF funding uh, to schools. Uh, what I would indicate, and I think we also need to be careful as well in terms of um, it is also the case I think that there is significant achievement in terms of reaching a lot of the targets now at one level the figures of complete compliance will show that there are 40 percent of schools that are completely compliant on every uh, section of this uh, there's also the case I think that uh, in terms of overall compliance if you take the individual aspects of the key stage four or indeed the post 16 there's quite large percentages they're doing that. But of those who are failing to, uh, to meet them in full, um, for example, if you take a look, there are 66 schools that aren't meeting the, in, in full. Seven, for instance, are those because of the, um, the mix of the applied in general. But if you take, for instance, of the other 59 others, where the target is at, is at 24 courses, there's 51 out of those 59 are meeting between 20 and 23 courses. So there are a number of schools which are, from that point of view, just falling short. Uh, indeed, a mention of the seven schools that are failing to meet the target in terms of the mix. Of those seven, each is falling short by one general course. So the, the, the gap to be bridged is probably not that enormous on it. But I think it is actually also about looking to see what we can do from a practical point of view and a sensible point of view. If some of that is sharing, if some of that is saying that maybe we're actually asking schools to stretch a bit too more, too much or whatever, if there's issues around the broader level of funding that can be looked at. I think all those have got to be in the mix. I think one of the issues that needs to be explored, and I'm mindful of about 30 seconds, uh, Sir Deputy Speaker, um, is at the moment we know that a number of schools are falling below that. I think we probably do need to drill down a little bit more with those schools as to why they're failing, whether it's purely a question of finance, whether there's any other barriers, and have that bit of discussion with schools to see uh, how we can actually resolve those issues. Thank you. I call Jennifer McCann. Uh, thank the Minister for his previous answers and just listen to, to you know, some of the answers you've been given. You know, what actual steps um, are you and your department going to take um, you know, to address the issue? Because there's quite a number of schools, as you mentioned, of the percentage that aren't actually, um, they're failing to meet the entitlement framework. So what actual steps are your department going to do? I'm discussions, uh, I suppose in terms of prescience, uh, I'm holding discussions with officials actually at 3 o'clock this afternoon to look at what the best way forward in terms of entitlement framework. I, I'm conscious, um, and I think there has been a great benefit that's been delivered to pupils by the entitlement framework, uh, and I'm conscious of the fact that there may well be a range of reasons as to why schools are maybe falling just short. One of the things that probably we haven't done, um, I think certainly to a sufficient level, is have a bit of exploration with those schools as to why they're falling short. And I think if you're looking for solutions, you need to know what the reasons are behind things in the first place. Uh, and I think that, that starting that conversation will be, will be critical and it will be a degree of ongoing work. Now, whether that means as part of the overall process that we need to find short to medium term fixes to, to rectify situations in the, in the short term while looking at what the longer term uh, position is. But, you know, it is about retaining and building. It's not about uh, breaking down what, what is there. But I appreciate that, that there will be particular individual circumstances, individual schools. And let's see whether there's a particular pattern, whether it's simply the fact that to be able to provide that, it would create such a level of, of expenditure that's, that's beyond what the, the school is there. As I said, I, I think there is a strong case to look if we can provide greater degree of, of help and assistance where there could be a greater level of sharing in that regard. Because the key element to this will always be what is the offer in place to the individual student. And that should actually be the key driver on that to provide the maximum opportunity for that, that student to follow a range of pathways. Thank you. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Can the Minister give us an update on any conversations he has had with the Minister for Economy on a formal 14 to, 9, 14 to 19 strategy with collaboration between further education and post-primary sectors to ensure that the curriculum gives adequate attention to skills-based and vocational education? Look, that's a valid point. I think there's a wider 
context which this needs to be put in. And whenever I'm talking about an overall review of the curriculum, obviously a review of the curriculum goes beyond simply 14 to 19. So there are issues which have been raised with me in terms of, for instance, primary school curriculum around issues around languages, around a need to have a greater emphasis on STEM, for instance. But the principal focus in terms of curriculum reform will be on, I suppose, particularly the 14 to 19 and widening uh, that now. I've indicated, and I've indicated to a number of people, that in terms of that discussion which needs to take place, because it needs to be something that will be quite detailed, there is a key role not simply for the Department of Education and for schools and those bodies which fall, broadly speaking, within our, our remit, but a direct role for the Department of the Economy, for colleges as well, because I think one of the problems we have, which is one of the areas that we need to tackle, for instance, on area planning, uh, I know, Mr Speaker, the it, often in this house it seems like time stood stand still, at least from the point of view of the clock, it seems to have stood still. Very unwise to alert me to that. Go ahead. Absolutely. Well, I don't know if that means I've got two minutes from this point on. Um, but no, I mean, one of the problems I think we do have, for instance, if you look at the issue around sixth form, is that you have a number of schools where there's a high level of dropout rate once people get into lower sixth. And sometimes that is because maybe that is not the appropriate place for those students. And so therefore there's got to be a, a range of work which goes on in terms of the curriculum particularly focused on vocational pathways, uh, not simply with the Department of Education and its uh, our sort of uh, arm's length bodies in schools, but with the Department of the Economy, with colleges, but also actually particularly with, with industry and business as well. I know I've met with, for instance, the CBI who are keen to be involved in that, that strand of work as well. It will be something that will have to be taken forward on a cross-departmental basis and will go beyond, if you like, a, simply an initial conversation, but into something a great deal more depth as we move ahead. Thank you. We move on. Time stands for no person. Uh, Mr. Daglin, I get a question about three questions. Three other whole. Okay. Um, 35.3 million euro is, is made available for shared education through Peace 4, covering Northern Ireland and also the border region of, uh, of the Republic of Ireland. Uh, in terms of the breakdown of that, that comprises 30 million euros through the European Regional Development Fund plus about 5.3 uh, million from both sides of the border in terms of uh, government matched funding. Although not yet open to schools and other educational settings, funding post-Brexit for Peace 4 is included in the guarantee by Treasury for structural uh, and investment fund programmes signed before the UK leaves the EU. Uh, I anticipate that processing applications from programme delivery bodies will be completed by the end of this year with agreement signed and implementation commencing in 2017. Programme funding will be provided until December 20, uh, 2020 to be spent by 2023. In relation to the other aspect of European funding, which is directly relevant uh, to uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the Erasmus Plus programme, the UK national uh, agency will continue to manage and deliver the programme across the UK, and all participants and, and beneficiaries should continue with their Erasmus Plus funded activities and preparations for the published application uh, deadlines in 2017. The UK Minister of State for Universities, uh, Joe Johnson MP, has stated that the EU referendum result does not affect students studying in the EU, beneficiaries of Erasmus Plus are those considering applications in 2017, and that the UK's uh, future uh, access to Erasmus Plus programmes will be determined as part of the wider discussions the UK government will be having with the, uh, with the EU. More broadly, existing e UK students studying in the EU and those looking to start in the next academic year will continue uh, to be subject to the current arrangements. Mr. McLear. Well, I'll get that. Thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister uh, tell us, has he um, spoken to the British Treasurer or, or did sought any assurances for replacement funding for projects that may lose out as a result of the um, vote on the EU exit? Well, directly speaking, I suppose, in terms of raising this issue, obviously it's part of the wider picture that the executive is raising with, the, uh, with that. Given that we've received a level of assurance on the Peace 4 funding, um, and indeed the impact, I suppose, particularly from an educational point of view, if you look, for instance, at Erasmus+, Plus, for example, the vast bulk of Erasmus+, Plus actually falls under the Department of the Economy side of it, because the schools element of it is relatively small. It is an issue, and it was discussed um, on Friday at the North-South Ministerial Council, I don't want to spoil anybody's appetite for whenever we get the, um, uh, the full briefing on that at a, statement at a later stage, so I, I'll not go further than that. But I have spoken directly to uh, my opposite number, education and skills. Maybe, maybe that has happened on that side of things. Uh, obviously, the, the Deputy Speaker is more prescient on these things than, than I would be in, in relation to that. 
Uh, but it obviously has been something also that's been raised in bilaterals between myself and the Education and Skills Minister from the Republic, Republic of Ireland. Uh, but in terms of the direct impact in Northern Ireland, it will be fairly minimal on the education side of things. Thank you. Um, Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, um, would the Minister consider commissioning a report to try and look at the benefits of EU funding for young people in Northern Ireland, if only to be at least prepared, should Brexit continue, that we're ready to bid for any money to be able to replace it? Um, I think that, Mr. McGrath, I think that, I'll tell the member that boat is, is already sailing effectively in that, in that regard, because the UK as a whole has, has voted to, to, to leave. You know, can I say in, in relation to that, uh, obviously there's a job of work for the overall executive to do. I'm not going to uh, compartmentalise that. But what I would indicate, for instance, I mentioned in terms of the issue of um, Erasmus Plus, there's around about um, 5 million euros on that. Of the stuff I think is going directly to schools, is around about, off the top of my head, about half a million on that bit. So I'm also conscious of the fact that not only should it not be ministers sailing off in their own direction as regards own individual studies, but indeed if we were to spend a reasonable amount of money doing a study into something which from an educational point of view is a relatively small amount of, of money, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that would necessarily be good value for money. I think what we do need in terms of the overall picture, I think the executive is cognizant of the need to ensure that, that both the difficulties and benefits of, of Brexit um, are both examined and indeed that we harness the maximum potential while trying to protect uh, those who are directly impacted on it as much as possible. I think that's a wider executive responsibility rather than, um, rather than very specifically on the educational side of things. Call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, since uh, Brexit is now blamed for every negative in society, <laughs> and I suspect the next thing it will be, be blamed for the weather, for the, the condition of it. Yeah. Could the Minister... <laughs> Could the Minister tell us today what will be the impact of Brexit on education here in Northern Ireland? Minister. Well, I mean, I, I did travel through the members' constituency briefly on Thursday on route to school in Straban, and then uh, heading back that direction. It was a very wet day. Nobody at that stage, to be fair, did blame Brexit uh, for it on that occasion, but, but th that may, may yet happen. You know, in terms of the, the overall impact on Brexit, as, as I've indicated, uh, and this is where, probably in terms of the levels of responsibility of my department compared maybe to uh, other bodies, because obviously particularly the Department of Education covers essentially up to 18, or in terms of special needs up to 19, more of the direct impact would hit in terms of, on Friday Goodrill, would be for instance in the Department of the Economy. There's a very minimal impact in terms of cost. As is indicated, um, there is provisions being made in terms of Piece 4 funding. And as indicated, I think, roughly speaking, in terms of the direct impact in schools on, for example, the Erasmus Plus project, which has been put in place, uh, it has a relatively minimal impact on schools. I think, as I said, the value of, of um, programmes was perhaps a little bit over half a million euros uh, on that basis. Now, that also means, I think, there are other things which have been mentioned in this House before, where there can be cooperation ongoing between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland irrespective of the EU, irrespective of Brexit, for instance, the Middletown Centre. And those are things which are not, from the point of view of linkages within uh, the Department of Education, are not dependent upon uh, membership of the, the EU and will be utterly unaffected by Brexit. Thank you. We move on. Call Mr Edwin Poots for question. Uh, there may not be time for supplementary. Question number four. Uh, there's a range of research and evidence which highlights the importance uh, of early years to the cognitive, emotional and physical growth of children. It's vitally important that children starting school have been and continue to be prepared, supported and encouraged to learn to take full ad advantage. Uh, there is no universal indicator of overall early childhood development. Uh, now, in working on this, I think there is a uh, work that's been ongoing with the Department of Health and Workstream 1 on the early intervention transformation programme in Northern Ireland um, Executive Atlantic Philanthropies. And as part of that Workstream 1, Workstream on a named health visitor is now aligned with every preschool education. There are, however, also, and because I suspect the member may have difficulty reaching a supplementary in that regard, there are, I think, very good initiatives on the ground. I know the member was on Friday with me at a launch within uh, Lisburn of um, an initiative for the Lisburn area in terms of early intervention, particularly the communication skills. Uh, the building, I think, on the top boost, which I think will be something that will also uh, apply. 
the scheme, I think, goes across four individual areas. So I think there are um, good actions that are being taken, and I think the importance of early years is, is critical. Unfortunately, that is uh, the time uh, over for listed questions, although the Minister did have remarkable powers of uh, um, predicting what the supplementary might have been. Um, we now move on to... We now, <laughs> we, we now move on to... Uh, more septic Meg than mystic Meg, I think. Um, we move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. At this morning's Ulster University Knowledge Economy report, it was stated that our GVA, driven by our intellectual capital, has dropped from 9.7% has dropped from 9.7% from 10.3. This is equivalent to a loss of 400 million pounds from our economy and much more worryingly indicates that we're on a downward trend. Can we get to the question? Would the Minister outline what approach he is taking to improving the educational attainment of our post-primary pupils in view of this very worrying trend? Well, obviously there's elements of this that will be more directly... Uh, I, I do feel sometimes the, the member will um, uh, see sort of bright skies out there and be looking actually for dark clouds on the horizon <laughs> in relation to that. But, and there will be... What's right? Well, Brexit, obviously, if Brexit is to be blamed for this, then perhaps you can also blame some of your colleagues as well for, uh, for that approach on it. Can I say, obviously, clearly there will be a range, there will be a range of, some of those issues are, are directly relevant to the economy, but it does underline, I think, the need to ensure that uh, as we move ahead, that there is a review of the curriculum. We do actually have considerable levels of success, and indeed, particularly in terms of uh, IT issues, it was one of the reasons why for instance, whenever we looked at the scope of exams that were available at GCSE in terms of the exam boards, one of the direct concerns that was raised, for instance, I think by Queen's University, was that, that what was then going to be on offer if we excluded um, the exam boards from outside Northern Ireland was that the uh, exam thing in terms of IT and computer science that was offered by CCEA was not effectively one that would be uh, as skills based. That's why I took action to try to ensure, for instance, that the uh, that the examinations uh, system was opened up again to try to make sure that it, it encompassed those to ensure that we have the most appropriate choice to be able to build on that skills base. There is a wider job of work as indicated in terms of the curriculum uh, from both uh, the Department of, the, of Education and also the Department of the Economy working alongside those who have a degree of, of expertise at uh, post-primary level uh, and tertiary level. Supplementary, Mr. Aiken. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for the Minister's comments. Um, one of the things that the Minister would like to do, I would like the Minister to outline what engagement he's planning to have with the Minister of Economy, as you've already said, and the Minister of Finance, because there's, significant short come, uh, or there's a shortfall in funding in this area, and that's an area we specifically need to look at. Well, I mean, in terms of funding, I think there's wider executive discussions around that. I think we need to ensure, I mean, let, let's be honest, we are in a, there is a difficult financial regime out there, so we've got to ensure that we get the, the best possible value for our money. As indicated in terms of meeting the tackling in terms of uh, the moves ahead indeed uh, on this issue, I think there will be a serious engagement that will be taking place with the Department of the Economy and the Minister uh, of it. Uh, there are a number of steps which have already been taken, particularly in terms of the skills barometer and indeed the careers ad advisory side of it, which has been joint working and is a good model between the Department of, the, of Education and the Department of the Economy, particularly to move beyond um, Simply, I mean, you know, there's always the accusation of departments operating in a degree of silent mentality, and I think that the Department of the Economy and the Department of Education, through actions such as that, can show that there's, there can be a level of cooperation to be able to tackle those, those problems. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister update the members on the Battlefield Project, uh, along with the Department of Communities? Well, thank the member for his, his uh, question. Obviously, I've been working alongside the Minister of Communities to bring forward a scheme which would allow school children and teachers from here to visit uh, the World War I battlefields. You know, that is something which in terms of the availability uh, has been available to, effectively to schools in England, but there hasn't been the same level. There have been a few schools that have, that have done it, but it hasn't been the same level of availability in Northern Ireland. I'm glad, I think, that that, that will mean that school children from Northern Ireland will now have the same opportunities as those in England and Scotland to visit the World War I battlefields. The scheme will be open to every post-primary school in Northern Ireland who wishes to avail of it. It's not compulsory, but at least it is being allowed. It will allow for two children and a teacher from East Post-Primary to visit the World War I battlefields. 
and that will ensure that the sacrifices of all those who served in the war and in terms of the First World War, there were people from right across the political spectrum and across the community that uh, were involved in that. And those are their families, because quite often I think in terms of a poignant visit, it will be actually to recall a relative and indeed perhaps visit a, a graveside of a relative who, who played that supreme sacrifice. But it will enable those, the sacrifices of those who served in the First World War to continue to be honoured and remembered. And so in terms of the detail of that, my officials are working with officials in the Department of Communities on the finer details, and it's my intention that we'll be able to launch the scheme before Christmas. Mr. Buchanan, supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for answer so far. Would the Minister be uh, of the mind to extend that to youth and community groups? It would also be the intention. I know there's ongoing discussions with the Department of Communities to be able to offer places on the scheme to youth and community groups, and that would provide an opportunity for young people in youth and community sector because I suppose while our focus quite often in education is purely on schools uh, there's obviously a remit particularly at the youth level that goes well beyond that. I think it's important that young people in youth and community groups can also benefit from the scheme ensuring I suppose that as many young people as possible from here will have the opportunity to visit the World War I battle sites and remember the sacrifice uh, of those who died there who died in effect to ensure the, the freedom and democracy that we're able to observe today. Uh, is put in place. I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Um, could the Minister outline what autism support services are available for children and their families in East Belfast, please? Well, it's obviously in terms of the support services, the, the direct funding comes from the department to the education authority, and they ensure that a range of educational provision to support children with autism, their families, and schools in East Belfast. The Authorities Autism Advisory and Intervention Service, or AAIS, provides support to pupils in schools through, uh, through training and advice to teachers, individual interventions with pupils, and also provides support to parents and families. Now, specifically in East Belfast, there's parent training and workshops available, and they include autism awareness, appropriate and effective home interventions, autism and relationships, social and, uh, and study skills, transition to post-primary school, uh, sensory processing difficult, uh, difficulties and personal independence skill. Parent training, I think, is provided at various times and locations uh, within East Belfast to accommodate, where possible, parental preferences. And this training is advertised through the, schools, uh, through the child's school setting. That includes uh, preschool setting as well. It's also advertised through email and through local health trusts. School training programmes in East Belfast include autism awareness, appropriate and effective uh, classroom and school interventions, uh, and adjustments, inclusion for children and young people with autism, social skills, sensory uh, processing difficulties in the uh, school environment, enhancing communication skills in the school setting, uh, and topical issues such as girls with autism, and it's provided within the school setting or also sort of uh, off school site. There's also, I think, um, training to other groups in East Belfast who support children with autism, including voluntary organisations, health professionals, and uh, youth centres. They also provide consultation and advice through that. And additionally, I suppose, which uh, is also the case that it works collaboratively, particularly with the Middletown Centre, who have the a level of expertise. And in addition to autism support I've outlined, there's other provision services within the AA, including early years inclusion team, educational psychology and behavioural support. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Douglas, <laughs> supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his answer uh, thus far. Uh, and I want to thank Ms. Well for attending the um, Helping Hands Autism Resource Centre in Ballybean. Um, would the Minister um, maybe look at what sort of support that that organisation, which is a group of families and volunteers, um, maybe if you look at maybe some help for them in the future? I enjoyed very much my trip down to there, and I think there's a tremendous potential. In addition to what's already happening in Ballybean, there's a potential for the future there, uh, and I know there's, there's ongoing work. I, I suppose this comes into two aspects. Again, it, it, the, uh, the direct funding organisation in each case will be the education authority, because they will be, have overall responsibility in terms of special needs. Uh, there is specific, uh, obviously, education funding for special needs through the EA budget. There is also, um, in terms of the level of resource funding for youth services, because this can also come under youth service, of uh, 33 million. Uh, obviously, under the Article 37 of the Education and Libraries Order, um, the EA has direct responsibility for the provision of those services. Uh, and indeed, in terms of youth services, it covers a wide range. It could be between 
uh, ages between 4 and 25, which I think is something very much within the remit of Helping Hands. I understand that Helping Hands is currently registered with EA Youth Services and is currently therefore receiving uh, resource funding. Uh, there has been additionally, I suppose, a, a call put out in terms of voluntary youth capital uh, to fund groups that are registered with the Education Authority, again, which Helping Hands is, is eligible to apply for. Uh, and if, you know, so from that point of view, there is a direct source in that, but there's no open call beyond that that is, is specific. But I mean, I wish uh, Helping Hands, I congratulate them on their work so far, and I wish them all the success for the future. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, I've held a, a meeting, I'm sure a number of the members have held meetings with teachers recently, concerned uh, about their pay dispute and conditions. And with that in mind, at next month, the National Association uh, of School Workers Union of Women Teachers plan to hold a one-day strike. Can the minister detail what measures he has in place to mitigate uh, against any impact on children in the well, classrooms? I'd, I'd be very worried if I answer this in detail, Chris, that will, will kill me, given the fact that he's been given a, an urgent oral at 3.30. Um, I would highlight as well, I think the date that's been referred to, I think is the 30th of November, uh, which is obviously within this. Look, I would appeal, I think there, there has been indication, I'll get into greater detail of this at the, uh, the urgent or later stage. Uh, there has been uh, correspondence which has gone out from the uh, education authority to all schools in, in connection with this. There's also an indication, I think, that, that I would appeal to any of the unions to suspend any industrial action to try to actually have discussions in relation to this. Now, I'm not going to pretend that there's additional money that is there in terms of the budget, but there's a wider context that needs to be examined in terms of where we move on from 2017 onwards. And we can't simply have a situation in which we have almost ad nauseum a level of industrial dispute, because NSUWT, this is not, well, the particular actions relate to this, NSUWT, for instance, have been on constant industrial action for the last five years. Uh, it's been ongoing since 2011 on different things. I think what we need to have is a level of sensible conversation. So I would appeal as uh, the management side of the Teacher Negotiating Council for unions not to implement strike action, which will only be detrimental to pupils, indeed in many ways also detrimental to their own members, but have that wider discussion on where we can take things forward from 2017 um, onwards. Let's try and put the past behind us and actually look to the future. Uh, order. Whilst the Minister has answered that question, uh, we should carefully note that an, uh, permission has been granted for an urgent oral question to the Minister on uh, this issue at a, approximately 3.30. Uh, can the member bear that in mind as he, as he brings forward his supplementary? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's you told off. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I suppose only being new to the House, I'm only going to get away with this one or two more times. Uh, with that in mind, I'm more than happy to wait uh, for, the, for the debate, uh, uh, the, the urgent oral, and for the, okay. the supplementary to be answered in that point. Okay. We, I guess it's not repeating. I okay, prefer the member to the answer. We move on. I call Jerry Kelly. Can I ask the Minister to outline the key messages uh, in the Chief Inspector's annual report? Well, yeah, I think what should I mean? I think the Chief Inspector report, I mean, look, the inspector will hold schools to a very high standard of account. I think what we, we saw was a, a mixed picture that emerged from that. I think to quote the report itself, it talked about um, that there's much to celebrate within our system. I think what we've seen in terms of the level of inspection reports that for primary schools have remained on a fairly high, uh, steady but fairly high basis, and we've seen a level of improvement in terms of post-primary schools, but it also offers a level of challenges that, that are there that we don't necessarily have everything that is fit for purpose in part because I think we need to ensure that education resources are focused in very directly on that. I think, again, it, it highlights a need to ensure that, that where we can have that early intervention to make wider changes, I think, need to be taken as well. I think it's a very useful document in terms of drilling down into that because, obviously, the inspectorate, while it receives its budget directly through the Department of Education, is an independent organisation. And at times, I suppose, particularly schools will be certainly a little bit frustrated at the level of, of, um, of independence that is there from the, the inspector, but I think it is also important that we acknowledge that schools, in terms of trying to deliver, and some have been very successful at this, are delivering against a very tight financial background indeed. Some are improving, some are remaining the same, despite the fact that their budgets are tighter in that regard. Quick supplementary, Mr Kelly. Even uh, Frank, I thank you, Minister, for the answer up tonight. I suppose, I mean, I appreciate the Minister will be looking at underachievement, but if I could ask him to be a bit more specific about how this report 
uh, will focus himself and his department into that issue of, of educational wellness. I think the report, because obviously this is a key part of the PFG as, as well, this is part of the, the key targets on it. You know, I think it's important that if we're looking to see what actions are taken in terms of underachievement, it's against baseline of data which shows where particularly some of the problems are. And I think that is where particularly the scoping exercise, because the other advantage, uh, again, with the inspectorate, albeit against, I think, toughening conditions of, from a financial budget point of view, it is able to give snapshots, not simply of where we are today, but where we were in 2014, where we were in 2012, etc. I think there are, I have to say, while there's challenges to be there, there are encouraging messages as well. So we have seen, for instance, a driving up of standards, particularly amongst those uh, in terms of improved exam results, particularly for those on free school meals, for instance. And I think that is something to be uh, welcomed. So I think we need to embrace where there are gains and see where there are further gaps. I think it does give a statistical basis and indeed a professional judgment basis on what needs to happen next in terms of the, the action. So that's why I believe it's a very important uh, document. Thank you. Time is up. We must now move on to 